Okay, today we're talking about uh, hormones in the brain, chapter 5. It's a kind of a short chapter, so this won't take very long, too long anyway. There we go, hormones in the brain. Animals use several types of chemical signals in the body to communicate or deliver information. Neurocrine uh, has to do with uh, synaptic communication. Neuro, of course, has to uh, uh, deals with neurons. Autocrine, the hormone activating the release gland. Auto means self. Uh, paracrine, a hormone targeting nearby cells. Para means uh, near. Uh, endocrine, uh, hormone passing through the uh, blood to distant targets. Endo means inside. And pheromone, uh, communication between individuals. Neurocrine uh, communication is synaptic communication. This communication is highly localized, as you can see, neurocrine uh, functioning. Autocrine function in an autocrine cell, the secreted hormone is released by the cell and then finds receptors on their own cell to attach to autocrine self. Paracrine function uh, cells uh, release a chemical communicator that affects a nearby target cell. Uh, the strongest uh, impacts are to nearby cells. As we're going to find out, uh, there are paracrine cells in the uh, pancreas uh, that uh, communicate uh, with, uh, between the uh, alpha and beta cells. Endocrine uh, communication is through the release of a, blood, a hormone into the bloodstream. Uh, the blood takes the hormonal signal to distant targeted organs where the hormone changes the function of the targeted organ. A good example of this would be the pituitary gland uh, trying to, talking to the uh, uh, adrenal glands on, your, on the top of your kidneys, pituitary glands in your brain. It will release uh, select hormones, uh, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, and that will uh, talk to the, uh, that will go through your bloodstream and talk to your adrenal glands and get your adrenal glands to release cortisol. Hormones released into the environment are carried from their originator to another individual of the same species. Human females may release pheromones that regulate their menstrual cycles. Uh, this is very controversial. We've been looking for human pheromones for a long time. Um, for a very long time, uh, for a couple hundred years, and we haven't been very successful. Uh, we think we have, and then, then it turns out, well, not everybody has the same structures. Uh, and we know that animals, of course, communicate by pheromones. If you've ever had a, a dog or a cat uh, in heat, uh, then uh, you know that uh, dogs from all over the neighborhood all of a sudden show up, male dogs from all over the neighborhood. Uh, show up to uh, to try to breed uh, with your female dog um, or cat, whichever the case may be, of course. Uh, it's really kind of weird uh, how they communicate with the, uh, how pheromones communicate. We know all uh, most other animals uh, have pheromones. The question is, do humans? Um, this is controversial because uh, the Pheromones are detected through an organ called the vomeronasal uh, organ, the, the uh, VNO, uh, and not all humans have a vomeronasal organ. Uh, so the question is, uh, is this something that, that, uh, that, that humans have or do, do they not? Uh, personally, I have uh, detected pheromones in other individuals before, uh, so this is... Uh, this is a, a, a done deal as far as I'm concerned, uh, but we do know that there are select groups of, of, uh, of humans that do not react to pheromones or, and do not potentially have pheromones and probably don't have a vomeronasal organ. But uh, I'm pretty sure that I do <laughs> since I have detected them. Uh, it gets a little weird. And it's it's something that, that people argue about, and I, I, and I'm not exactly sure why why people don't want their to, uh, people to, to uh, react to pheromones. Uh, I have a feeling it has to do with trying to 
separate us from lower animals uh, as if humans are are special uh, so so they don't, they don't react to the same things as it, that other animals do uh, alimones are, are chemical signals that are released by one species and affect a member of another species flowers will release alimones to attract insects that will carry their pollen to another plant of their species uh, I, we have an infestation uh, when we're talking about pheromones we have an infestation of uh, of Japanese beetles and um, uh, Japanese beetles will just devastate uh, all of your fruit trees and we've had a problem with them over the last three or four years uh, and the only way that we can combat them is to there's there's several ways that you can fight them uh, you really can't spray them because then you spray your fruit and and now you got a problem because now you've got poison all over your fruit uh, so what we have to do is we use uh, pheromonal signals to uh, get the male, uh, the, uh, the male Japanese beetles to fly into a trap, and then we, we uh, kill them. Uh, <laughs> it sounds kind of horrible, but the reality is they just, they've killed one of our apple trees. We, had, we used to have two really big apple trees out there, and they both just produced like crazy. Uh, but... Uh, the second year we were here, uh, the Japanese beetles just ate one tree and, and it died. You know, it's so it's, it's, it's us against them. It's a situation where you will either have no fruit at all uh, and no trees at all, or we'll do something about the Japanese beetles. And what we do is we use a pheromonal, tr uh, pheromonal uh, lure, and the lure brings the, uh, the uh, beetles into a trap, and then we drown them as horrible as that sounds, but uh, it's either us or them, I guess. Alimones, okay, so we already talked about alimones, uh, and that's that's how flowers uh, will get a, uh, a bee or or other uh, creatures, bees and uh, what else, uh, bats, uh, butterflies, they will uh, be attracted to the uh, to the flower, and they'll take the pollen from from one flower to the next, and that's how they that's how uh, plants uh, function. <laughs> and if it wasn't for bees, if it wasn't for insects, uh, plants would have a difficult time. They'd have to hope that the wind was blowing in the right direction in order to uh, pollinate. Uh, ten general principles of hormone action: uh, hormones frequently act in a gradual fashion. Behavioral and physical responses occur only after weeks of treatment and may last for several days. Uh, number two, when hormones do alter behavior, they tend to act by changing the intensity or probability of a behavior. They do not act as a switch. Uh, the quantities and types of hormones released are influenced by the environmental as well as internal factors. High levels of testosterone cause aggressive behavior. The most aggressive individual wins an encounter and maintains their testosterone level while the loser suffers a lowering of testosterone after the encounter. And this uh, we have seen uh, time and time again. A person who is a fan for a select football team, if his team wins, he has a higher testosterone. If we uh, draw testosterone from, from him and uh, the individual that lost, uh, whose team lost, uh, what we'll find is that the winner has a higher testosterone than the loser does. This gets a little bit interesting when you're watching a game, uh, a lot of, especially a football game. Uh, a lot of times uh, teams will just pour it on. Uh, they'll just keep overscoring and overscoring. You know, they've already defeated the other team. Now, now they're just scoring points. They're just scoring touchdowns and field goals and whatnot. And the reality is that a lot of it has to do with uh, the testosterone. So when you're winning, uh, you're a little bit more pumped up, uh, and therefore that you would be more likely to be aggressive and to uh, to to, to uh, pour it on, as it were. Each hormone has multiple multiple effects on different tissue organs and behavior. Uh, conversely, a single type of behavior or physiological change can be affected by many different hormones. Number five, hormones are produced in small amounts and are secreted in bursts. 
uh, pulsating patterns are sometimes crucial for, for the uh, small amount of hormone to be effective. Uh, number six, levels of many hormones vary rhythmically throughout the day. Uh, many hormonal systems are controlled by circadian clocks in the brain. A good example of this would be cortisol. We have a cortisol uh, spike at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we have a, a second uh, cortisol spike at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And you can, uh, you can set your watch by it, as weird as that is. Uh, when I worked in the laboratory, especially when I worked with children uh, in, in a pediatric uh, hospital, uh, we would draw cortisols from, from kids, and we had to draw them right on, right on the, the, the uh, second. Uh, as soon as it turned 8 o'clock, we had to uh, be drawing the blood out of their, out of their vein. Uh, same way at 4 o'clock. You could either draw them at 8 o'clock or 4 o'clock because that's when they had um, cortisol spikes. Hormones affect the met <laughs> metabolic process in many cells and induce long-term metabolic change through the buildup and breakdown of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Number eight, hormones interact. Uh, the effects of one hormone can be markedly changed by the actions of another hormone. Uh, the chemical structure of a given hormone is similar to all vertebrates. Uh, the functions served across species can vary. Uh, this is uh, something, let's see, um, we give, uh, in order for, for uh, cows to mature rapidly, we give them uh, growth hormone. Uh, and people are, have been saying that that may be changing uh, the reactions of our children. Our children are getting larger because they're eating beef that have excess amounts of, of growth hormone. Well, beef growth hormone isn't the same thing. It, bovine growth hormone isn't the same thing as human growth hormone. Yet uh, some people think that it has an effect on... Uh, on humans. Uh, number 10, hormones can affect only cells that possess a receptor protein that recognizes the hormone and alters cell function. In different vertebrates, uh, the same brain regions often possess the same hormone receptors. Neural communication works somewhat like an old uh, wire telephone or telegraph system. Messages travel over fixed channels to precise destinations. Uh, it used to be that way. Now, of course, most of our telephone is uh, by satellite. Uh, but uh, in the old days, it was uh, by wire, and everyone had uh, two wires running into their house. They had an electric wire that gave us that gave the house electricity, and a second wire was a, a telephone line, and that allowed them to have a, a, a telephone. Uh, in order to make long distance calls in the old days. Uh, you would have to call from your telephone and, of course, it'd go by wire uh, to a relay station someplace and then it would have to transfer. Um, it it uh, didn't take very long. Of course, it only took a matter of seconds to make these connections, um, but uh, uh, it was expensive uh, because they had to, to run all those wires uh, from one place to another. Uh, the structure of, a con of connections between neurons and, uh, determines the transmission of, of information from one cell to another. Endocrine uh, communication works like television broadcasting systems. Hormones are broadcast uh, in the blood, and any number of scattered receptors throughout the body receive the message and respond to it, just like uh, the old uh, television receptors. Now everything's done by satellite. It's a little bit different, or cable, or whatever. Um, so uh, it's, it's a little bit different than it used to be. It's actually the same, I guess, because what they're doing is, uh, if it's a live feed, uh, what they will do is they will broadcast it out, and it will be picked up by certain, by select satellite uh, uh, receptors. If you've got a dish or, or a, what's the other one? I can't think of the other one. Anyway, if you've got a dish or whatever the, the other... The other system is that it will it will your re receiver will will grab the signal and then it will will uh, take it to your uh, television set, and that's the way the endocrine system works. Uh, 
Neural messages are very rapid and are measured in milliseconds. Hormonal messages are slow and are measured in seconds or even minutes. Most neural messages are all or none responses. Uh, hormonal messages are analog, uh, graded in strength by the amount of hormone that's released. So a neural, uh, a neural reaction is always the same. It's always uh, a complete reaction. But a hormonal message could be a, a small message or a large message. Uh, and the reason is because that's, it's, it's analog. And that's what analog means. Neural responses are very often voluntary, uh, while hormonal responses are not voluntary. Both systems store chemical transmitters for future release. Uh, both systems are st stimulated uh, to respond by an outside source. Uh, both systems are quite complex and maintain many different chemical transmitters. Uh, some hormones used by the endocrine system are also produced by neurons and used as uh, neurotransmitters. Both systems use transmitters that have specific receptors on the receiving target cells that respond to, to the stimulation. Both systems may produce a second messenger response in a targeted cell that brings about two levels of changes at the same time. Second messenger system. There are three categories of hormones. Uh, there's amine hormones, steroid hormones, and protein hormones. The protein hormones, if you look at the uh, uh, table on the on the left, uh, you can see that the protein hormones are there. Okay, the, there's a lot of protein hormones. Uh, the protein hormones are, are uh, composed of strings of amino acids. Uh, during a corticotropic hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, thyroid-stimulating hormone, growth hormone, prolactin, insulin, uh, glucagon, uh, oxytocin, vasopressin, uh, the releasing hormones such as corticotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormones, those are all protein hormones. Uh, amine hormones are composed of a single amino acid. Uh, these uh, epinephrine, uh, norepinephrine, thyroid hormones, and melatonin are the amine hormones. Uh, the steroid hormones are composed of four interconnected rings of carbon atoms rather than amino acids, and these are the uh, gonadal uh, hormones, estrogens, progestins, and uh, androgens, and uh, the adrenal hormones, the steroids, uh, glucocorticoids, and mineral corticoids. Okay. The effects of hormones. Uh, hormones promote the proliferation, growth, and differentiation of cells. Uh, thyroid hormones pres present at birth support brain development and growth. Two hormones modulate cell activity. Gonadal hormones modulate the uh, onset and maintenance of, a, of secondary sexual characteristics with puberty. Pro protein hormones and, and most amine hormones bind to receptor molecules on the surface, surface of target cell membranes. This releases a second messenger in the cell because of the rapid process of protein binding Protein and amine hormones tend to act very rapidly. Steroid hormones must pass through the cell membrane and bind to specific receptor proteins inside the cell. The combined steroid receptor complex then binds to DNA inside the nucleus. The effect of gene expression may increase the production of some proteins and decrease, decrease others. Now we're going to watch a film about second messenger. Epinephrine is one of many hormones that is water-soluble, hydrophilic, and therefore unable to cross the hydrophobic plasma membranes of its target cells. Instead, it binds to receptor proteins located in the plasma membrane and does not enter the cell. When epinephrine binds to beta-adrenergic receptors on the liver cell, G proteins on the inner side of the cell membrane are activated. Each G protein is composed of three subunits, and the binding of epinephrine to its receptor protein causes one of the G protein subunits to dissociate from the other two. The G protein subunit, which dissociates from the others, carries a GDP, which is replaced by GTP when the subunit is activated. 
The activated G protein subunit then diffuses within the plasma membrane until it encounters adenylyl cyclase, a membrane enzyme that is inactive until it interacts with the G protein subunit. When activated by the G protein subunit, adenylyl cyclase catalyzes the formation of CAMP from ATP. The CAMP formed at the inner surface of the membrane diffuses within the cytoplasm where it binds to and activates protein kinase A, an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to specific cellular proteins. In liver cells, protein kinase A phosphorylates and thereby activates another enzyme called phosphorylase, which converts glycogen into glucose 6-phosphate. The glucose 6-phosphate is then converted to glucose. Through this multi-step mechanism, epinephrine causes the liver to secrete glucose into the blood during the fight-or-flight reaction. Ta-da! Okay. There we go. Let's get rid of this. There we go. Okay, so the second, second messenger system, as you can see, uh, it, it does take a little bit of time. Most of the hormonal systems in the endocrine system control themselves through a negative feedback system. A gland detects a, a need to produce the hormone. The hormone is produced. The need is taken care of. Uh, the gland is no longer stimulated by the need. The gland produces only enough hormone to take care of the level of the need. Insulin's negative feedback loop. Uh, glucose from the meal enters the bloodstream. The increased glucose triggers the pancreas to produce more insulin. The insulin enables the cells of the body to utilize the glucose for energy. As the level of glucose in the blood decreases, the pancreas is stimulated to produce less and less insulin. A balance is maintained. Now, when we talk about insulin, uh, we have to talk about diabetes. We don't have to, I guess. But let's go ahead and talk about diabetes. Uh, there's two different types of diabetes. Diabetes, one, uh, has to do with uh, not producing enough insulin. Diabetes 2 is where the individual becomes, their body, their, the cells in their body become insensitive to, to insulin. Uh, so no matter how much glucose you take in, uh, your body isn't producing, uh, it, it, it produces insulin, but the insulin isn't able to convert uh, the glucose to a functional form uh, so that the body can utilize it. And that's, uh, so the cells actually become insensitive to, to, uh, to the insulin, and that's type 2 diabetes. That's the kind that is most prevalent on the reservation. Uh, type 1 diabetes tends to be genetic. Uh, type 2 diabetes has to do with uh, lifestyle, it tends to be have to do with lifestyle, and that's the way it is. And a lot of times it has to do with uh, uh, how much uh, sugar somebody takes in. Uh, in their uh, in their lifetime. Uh, so if you take in too much sugar, uh, your body uh, may potentially become uh, insensitive to the uh, uh, to the glu to uh, insulin. The pituitary gland rests in a depression in, of the skull directly behind the nasal cavity. The pituitary gland consists of two parts: the anterior pituitary, which is constructed of glandular tissue and the posterior pituitary, which is constructed of neural tissue. The pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus by a thin piece of tissue called the pituitary stalk. The axons of the hypothalamus reach into the pituitary gland, but only in the posterior pituitary. The axons from the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus stimulate the posterior pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin and arginine vasopressin. Because of the vascular, vascular structure of the posterior pituitary, both oxytocin and vasopressin are rapidly released into the bloodstream. Vasopressin is also known as antidiuretic hormone. This hormone helps conserve water by inhibiting the formation of urine in the kidneys. It is stimulated by areas in the supraoptic and the paraventricular nucleuses that detect thirst and water needs. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, even if you drink water uh, during the day, uh, uh, 
uh, if you're if it's in a, if you're sweating a lot, uh, then your you will not produce urine. Uh, I don't know if this if you've ever experienced this, but uh, you can drink you can continue to drink a great deal of water uh, in a, on a sweaty hot day uh, as long as you're sweating out a, a lot of uh, fluids, uh, then you will not produce your uh, you won't produce any urine. Now the question is why in the world. Uh, you should be producing urine all the time. Why in the world are you not producing any urine? And the answer is because of the vasopressin. You don't need it. You're all, you're getting rid of your water in another way. Your body is telling your kidneys that it doesn't need to produce urine. Uh, and the reason it doesn't need to produce urine is because you're getting rid of your water, uh, your the fluid inside your body in a different in a different way. And this is what happens to you when you run. Let's say you run three miles. Uh, you're going to sweat a select amount of water uh, out uh, at that time. Uh, even if you take it in, uh, then potentially you will still lose weight uh, and, and you won't have to urinate. And the reason is because your body is losing the water in a different way than, uh, than collecting it in your bladder. Oxytocin also is produced by the posterior pituitary. Ox oxytocin stimulates the contraction of the uterine wall that speeds up childbirth. Oxytocin also triggers a contraction of the cells in the mammary glands that allows the milk to be released from the breast. Because the process takes 30 to 60 seconds, the experienced mother will begin responding to her child's cries rather than suckling. Then the suckling, and what happens is, of course, she starts leaking from the, the breast as soon as the baby starts crying. Her breast will, uh, her nipples will start leaking milk, and that's because she is the oxytocin has uh, has been stimulated, and the oxytocin is causing the uh, milk to come down into the breast. While oxytocin allows other animals to reproduce in humans, it mediates sexual arousal and affection response. Uh, so the question is, do males have oxytocin since they don't have uterine walls and they don't have mammary glands? Do uh, males, actually males do have mammary glands, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, so what, what is their oxytocin for? And the answer would be it makes them uh, nest, just like women nest. Uh, males will build a house. Uh, and we've seen this in, in other creatures. If you, uh, uh, if you guys don't have red-winged blackbirds, but we have them. We have them up here. Uh, what will happen is the males will come into an area first in the spring, and they will build nests to attract the females. And uh, it's the oxytocin that tells them that they need to produce nests. Otherwise, they won't be able to uh, find a. They won't be able to breed because the female won't, female won't have a nest to uh, lay her eggs in. So that's uh, one of the things, one of the curious things uh, in nature. Uh, the uh, male uh, red-winged blackbird, and then he sings his heart out trying to attract females. It's really kind of interesting to watch. Uh, they're called red-winged blackbirds. They don't really have red wings. What they have is uh, it's like sergeant stripes on their, on their, on their wings. They're kind of interesting. You can look them up after. After class, after I'm, I'm done with my lecture, the anterior pituitary is made up of glandular cells rather than neural cells as the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is controlled by releasing hormones produced in the hypothalamus and are transported to the anterior pituitary through a network of capillaries called hypothalamic pituitary portal system. The neuroendocrine cells of the hypothalamus that produce the releasing hormones are controlled by two influences. They receive uh, neural impulses from other parts of the hypothalamus that either inhibit or excite their releasing capacity. Circulating messages from other hormones directly affect them. Corticotropin releasing hormone uh, from hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary gland to re re release adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH, that stimulates the adrenal glands to produce corticosteroids. Thyroid tropin releasing hormone, TRH, stimulates the pituitary gland to produce thyroid stimulating hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones. Uh, 
TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. So if you've ever had any problems with your thyroid or if they were checking your thyroid, they probably checked your thyroid hormones, your T3 and T4, and they also checked your TSH to, to see if you are producing enough TSH. As we're going to find out, the thyroid gland uh, maintains, uh, usually when you detect that you have a problem with your thyroid gland, uh, it's after you've already had a problem for a while. Uh, you, you maintain about 100 days worth of, uh, of uh, thyroid hormones, uh, so you're not, you're not aware that you have a problem for about 100 days after things go, uh, start shutting down. Prolactin-releasing peptide and prolactin-inhibiting factor are produced by the hypothalamus to control the amount of prolactin released from the pituitary gland. Prolactin controls lactation in women. Uh, somatocrinin uh, stimulates and somatostatin inhibits. Uh, they are produced by the hypothalamus to stim stimulate the pituitary gland to produce growth hormone, which controls bone growth. And that is somatos somatocrinin and somatostatin. Uh, Gonadotropin-releasing hormone is produced by the hypothalamus, which stimulates the pituitary gland to produce luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. In the female, uh, luteinizing hormone stimulates the release of ova from the ovaries and prepares the uterine wall for implantation. Follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates secretion of estrogen and influences ova production. In the male, uh, luteinizing hormone stimulates the testes to produce testosterone and uh, follicle-stimulating hormone influences sperm production. So as we can see, the, whether you're a male or a female, uh, one will, uh, one, uh, in the male, the uh, luteinizing hormone and uh, follicle-stimulating hormone uh, allow the uh, individual to uh, prepare for uh, reproduction. Uh, in the female, it's exactly the same thing. Luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone prepare the female to reproduce. So in both the male and the female, these two uh, uh, hormones are quite important. The adrenal glands are, are situated on top of each kidney. Uh, like the pituitary gland, the adrenal glands are divided into two portions, the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. And the reality is they look like a glob of fat. They really do. Uh, fat is yellow, and so are the adrenal glands. And uh, kidneys tend to be relatively dark because they are highly vascularized. And uh, so they're fairly dark, and the uh, adrenal glands are kind of yellowish. Uh, and because of that, they look like globs of fat on top of your kidneys. The adrenal medulla releases the amine hormones, the epinephrine and norepinephrine, in response to the sympathetic nervous system. The adrenal cortex produces and secretes some of the steroid hormones, the adrenal corticoids. Uh, the adrenal corticoids affect the metabolism of carbohydrates. Cortisol is an example of a glucocorticoid. The second group of adrenal steroids is the mineral corticoids, which affect the ion concentration of sodium in the kidneys. Uh, aldosterone acts on the kidneys to reduce urine output and conserve sodium, thus also conserving water. The adrenal cortex also produces sex steroids. The chief sex steroid produced by the adrenal cortex is androstenedione, uh, the steroid that uh, Mark McGuire was using when he broke the Major League home run uh, record. Of course, it was uh, broken two years later by Barry Bonds. Uh, Androstenedione uh, contributes uh, to adult hair growth patterns in men and women. An overabundance in a woman can lead to a more masculine hair growth pattern. And I have some pictures right here, as you can see. Uh, this young lady, the lady on top, has uh, hair growth uh, around her ears, uh, just like men when they're growing a beard. And the young lady on the bottom uh, has hair growth on her forehead. You can see there, both uh, young ladies have uh, very thick uh, eyebrows. Uh, no mustaches though. It's also they ha also have uh, what they call a moon face. It it gets a it is uh, becomes rounder, uh, and that is uh, because of the steroids that they're taking. And as you can see, uh, she actually has uh, hair on her forehead.
as weird as that is, and on her cheeks, not so much on her chin, but you can see the lady on top, of course, has thick eyebrows, and she also has uh, thick hair uh, just below her ear. Their adrenal cortical hormones are controlled by ACTH, released from the pituitary gland. Stress is detected by the hypothalamus. Uh, it releases uh, cortico-releasing hormone, corticotropin-releasing hormone, uh, to induce the pituitary to release ACTH. Uh, unfortunately, the gluco glu glucocorticoids released because of the ACTH, when released at high levels, can kill nerve cells in the hippocampus. The hippocampus, of course, has to do with your memory. Uh, glucocorticoids have to do with stress uh, or fight or flight. Uh, if you're f actually fighting or fleeing, you're okay. But if your stress has to do with uh, uh, has to do with uh, interactions, daily interactions with people, then uh, all of a sudden uh, your the stress is causing you a lot of damage, uh, especially damage in your in your hippocampus, which uh, is is your memory. And this is not good. Thyroid gland is uh, is located around your esophagus, just below your voice box. If you're a male, of course, you have a fairly prominent voice box. If you're a female, you don't. Uh, Adam's apple is what uh, is what the voice box is. Uh, three hormones secreted from the thyroid include thyroxin T4, uh, also known as T4, uh, triiodothyrone, uh, which is uh, known as T3, and calcitonin. The hormones are stored in the thyroid uh, colloid. Uh, thyroid maintains a large supply of hormones, about 100 days worth. Calcitonin promotes uh, calcium use in the bones. Uh, T4 and T3 your levels are regulated by TSH released by the anterior pituitary. T3 and T4 are amines but act as steroids, passing through the cell membrane membrane, finding a receptor in the cell, and then binding to the DNA. Uh, this uh, regulates your metabolism. Metabolism has to do with you maintaining your body. So when you're asleep at night, you're actually burning a lot of, of uh, calories. And the reason is because the T3 and T4 are telling your body to maintain all the cells in your body. So that's a good time to uh, repair yourself. Uh, while, when you're asleep, it's also a good time to build yourself up and this is one of the reasons why if you weigh yourself just before you go to bed and you weigh yourself after you, right after you get up, then you've probably lost a couple pounds of weight. And that's because of your metabolism. T3 and T4 are released from the thyroid gland because of the influence of TSH from the pituitary gland, which is induced to release T TSH when stimulated by thy thyrotropin-releasing hormones secreted by the hypothalamus. The thyroid hormones are critically dependent on iodine. Now, where in the world does iodine come from? As it turns out, iodine comes from the ocean. And it also, so we take it in not by drinking uh, seawater, but we take it in by eating seafoods. So for the longest time, uh, humans had to stay relatively close to the shore so that they could eat seafood, so that they would be relatively so that they could be healthy. They really couldn't move inland, but we did anyway, and sometimes it gave us trouble. An inadequate supply of iodine will lead to hypothyroidism. So uh, we, we don't really see hypothyroidism along the coasts of, of any of the continents, but we see them inland. So the farther inland they are, uh, the more likely that the individual will be hypothyroid. Since the thyroid output is inadequate, the pituitary uh, produces more and more TSH to compensate, to compensate, but only succeeds in enlarging the thyroid in a condition known as goiter. And this is what goiter looks like, as you can see. In the U.S., uh, this is com combated with iodized salt. And this is the reason why, if you live in Arizona, uh, then it's a really good idea, since you're probably not eating a lot of seafood, and if I remember correctly, Navajos don't really eat a lot of seafood. Yeah, yeah, I was told that once. I don't know if that's how true that is. Anyway, if you don't eat a lot of seafood, you need to eat iodized salt. 
Uh, this was uh, religious in my family. I, I grew up in Indiana. Uh, my mother, they didn't really figure out what iodized salt was until the 1920s. Uh, my mother was born in 1915. So, and, and like I said, she lived in, in Indiana. Of course, see, there's no fresh seafood. There's no seafood at all in Indiana uh, because it's too far away from the coast. It's right, practically right in the middle of the country. Uh, you can eat fish, but uh, that just because it's fish doesn't make mean that it's seafood. Probably it's not. So she was really sensitive to these things, so she made sure that we all ate iodized salt. The first iodized salt was produced by Morton Salt, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the, the uh, people coming out of the Depression uh, were uh, religious about eating uh, Morton Salt because it was iodized, and that kept them from having goiter. In 1924, goiter was endemic in areas of the United States where iodine from seafood was not prevalent. That is the middle of the country. That's where my mother was. My dad was, from, uh, was born in Ohio, and Ohio, and he lived most of his life in Indiana. So his family and my mother's family were both inlanders. In Michigan, a study in 1923, despite the fact that Michigan is surrounded on three sides by water, it is fresh water. And of course, because it's fresh water, there's no iodine in the, uh, in, the, in the food, in the fish coming out of the uh, Great Lakes. In Michigan, a study in 1923 showed a 39% prevalence rate among school children. In Ohio, 31% of the school children were estimated to have goiter. Uh, in West Virginia, goiter was rare as long as local brown salt was used. Uh, when pure white salt replaced the brown, a 1922 study showed 61% of the school children had enlarged thyroid glands. And of course, this is what happens when you, that's, this is what happens. I can't, don't have a, a pointer. Anyway, uh, that's what happens when you don't eat, take in any iodine from seafood. And this is one of the reasons why uh, when we uh, were looking for ancient uh, uh, sites, uh, one of the, one of the uh, things, that, one of the best places to look is, of course, along the, the coast. But the coast changes, you know, they, it, it recedes, the ocean gets uh, higher, uh, and so some of those, a lot of those sites are under, underwater, unfortunately. As a fetus is developing, if the thyroid uh, hormones are not high enough, they will cause stunted growth, facial malformations, and reduction in brain, uh, brain size. Uh, another story about goiter. Uh, my mother, like I said, was born in 1915, and they didn't really uh, start putting iodine in salt until the 1920s. Well, by that time, she was in school, and she said that a lot of the uh, individuals uh, that she went to school with actually had goiter. I don't think, she never said she had goiter, but uh, the, some of the kids that she uh, went to school with, uh, some of them were picky eaters, strangely enough, and because they were, they were picky. Uh, iodine tastes bitter, kind of bitter. Uh, so iodized salt, uh, you probably don't even notice whether you're, you're taking in iodized salt or not. Uh, I'm kind of religious about it because my mother was. Uh, she was real sensitive about these things. Uh, if you look on your salt package, probably, uh, even if it's not uh, Morton salt, it probably is iodized salt anyway. Usually when you you get a salt packet uh, at a, a fast food restaurant, uh, the, the, it will be iodized salt. It's one of the things that we did because we were... Uh, kind of poisoning each uh, or poisoning ourselves back in the 20s. Another problem that they had back in the 1920s was uh, they had flour that wasn't enriched flour. And uh, since it wasn't enriched and a lot of people were poor and a lot of people ate a lot of uh, bread, uh, they were not getting all the minerals, uh, vitamins and minerals that they needed. Uh, so they started enriching bread. And the first bread that they enriched was da 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 Wonder Bread was what it was. Anyway, now all uh, all breads have enriched flour, uh, so we don't have to worry about that. But uh, once upon a time, uh, when they first discovered all this stuff, uh, they had to uh, they had to 
to be aware of, of what was going on. As a fetus is developing, if the thyroid hormones are not high enough, uh, they will cause stunted growth, facial malformations, and reduction in brain size. The baby will also suffer from intellectual disability in a condition known as cretinism. And that, now you understand where the word cretin comes from. It is a child. And as you can see, it's really kind of interesting if, you, uh, if you've ever seen a baby that had, was hypothyroid. Uh, this is, was one of my jobs when I was uh, working in the lab, was drawing blood from and doing the test for uh, children that we weren't exactly sure if, they had, if their thyroid was okay. In the state of, I was in Nebraska at the time, and the state of Nebraska, um, you have to draw a PKU on all the children. You also have to do a uh, maple syrup uh, test, and you also have to do a thyroid, a TSH, no, T4. And we, we were doing T4s on the kids to make sure that, they're, uh, that they weren't hypothyroid. Uh, if somebody's hypothyroid, they have an enlarged tongue, as weird as that is, and they, they, they don't close their mouth. Uh, they also have squinty eyes, as weird as that is, but uh, that has to do with hypo, being hypothyroid as well. And that's known as cretinism. The male gonads are the two testes uh, located in a sac uh, beneath the, uh, the penis. Uh, each testis uh, produces millions of sperm a day through Sertoli cells. In and among the Sertoli cells are Leydig cells, which secrete testosterone. Testosterone and other androgens are regulated by luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland. Luteinizing hormone is controlled by the release of gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. The female gonads are the ovaries. They are located above the vagina at the very bottom of the abdominal cavity. Uh, there are two ovaries, uh, one on each side of the uterus. Uh, the ovaries produce progestins and estrogens. The most important estrogen is estradiol. The primary progestin is progesterone. Uh, estrogens uh, trigger the production of progestin uh, receptors in the brain. Hence, with puberty, progestin sensitivity ushers in the menstrual cycle after estrogen is secreted from the ovaries. Okay, does this show where everything is? Yeah, and where's the ovaries? Yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, my second wife, uh, her, her fallopian tubes uh, of her ovaries were uh, adhesed to her colon for some reason. Uh, her ovaries were back. They weren't right in the middle of her, of her ab abdomen. They were, they were in the back. And since they were that far back, they attached themselves to the colon. And uh, they created a kink. And this late, poor lady, she, she wanted to have babies so bad, but she couldn't do it. She couldn't get pregnant. And the reason was because there was a, it was folded over. Her fallopian tube was folded over. Uh, it actually had a kink in it. And so the ovaries couldn't get out. I'm sorry, the ova couldn't get out. <laughs> anyway, so uh, she could never get pregnant. Luckily, I guess, it was completely blocked. I guess if the sperm had been able to get through there, they might have, uh, she might have uh, lost both of her, uh, her fallopian tubes to an ectopic pregnancy. But as it turned out, she had a surgery. Uh, she had a surgery uh, that uh, went in through her belly button, and they pulled the uh, fallopian tube away, and they straightened it out as best they could. Uh, as it turned out the first time, this is after, this is after we were no longer together. Um, she, uh, uh, first, right after they, they did the surgery, she had, uh, she got pregnant. Um, but unfortunately, the ova was too large to fit through the, the uh, unfolded, or, yeah, the unfolded uh, fallopian tube. And she had an ectopic pregnancy and it blew out one of her fallopian tubes. So she was really, really afraid after that to have sex because she was afraid she'd get pregnant again and she'd lose her other fallopian tube. Uh, so eventually what she did, what did she do? 
So eventually what she did, uh, she had uh, IVP done uh, just to make sure that she was able to get pregnant. She didn't want to lose her capability of having children. Uh, so uh, she uh, had IVP done where they harvested her ova. And uh, then they got them, uh, they uh, fertilized them. And uh, she had a set of twins. So everybody's happy, I guess. I don't know. I haven't talked to her for a while. <laughs> I haven't talked to her since, for 20 years, I guess, or since t 2001. Anyway, she had a little boy and a little girl. All three sex hormones, androgens, estrogens, and progestins have similar chemical structure. Uh, those chemical structures are four interconnected uh, carbon rings. <laughs> The sex hormones, along with the adrenal steroids, are derived from cholesterol. Uh, estrogens are synthesized from androgens, and androgens are synthesized from progestins. Both males and females have the same sex hormones, only in different proportions. And that is so that males will produce sperm and females will produce ova. Um, that will, there's, they have, uh, females have more luteinizing hormone, they have more follicle stimulating hormone because it's a more involved process. Uh, the males, of course, uh, their follicle-stimulating hormone and their luteinizing hormone is uh, inducing the, the male to produce sperm, uh, uh, yes, to produce sperm and testosterone. Unlike most brain structures, which are paired, there's only one pineal gland. It lays at the top of the, on the top of the brain stem the pineal gland produces the amine hormone melatonin. Melatonin receptors are metabotropic, thus they activate G proteins. Since melatonin activates metabotropic receptors, reaction to it is slow. Melatonin regulates the circadian rhythm and reaction uh, to uh, light and dark. Melatonin can uh, be used to move the sleep cycle up in the night. But because it has a metabotropic receptor, it only works over time. And of course, uh, once upon a time, they touted melatonin as a uh, sleep aid, uh, as something that you should take if you uh, had uh, jet lag uh, from going from one coast to the other coast or whatever. Uh, but uh, of course, since it's so slow, it really doesn't, it didn't work very well. The other thing they, they touted it as, uh, they. They said that if you take melatonin, uh, it will slow down your aging process because it will make you sleep longer and you will repair more. That was the idea. Anyway, it, that didn't work either. Uh, the pancreas serves two main functions. It produces digest digestive enzymes and as an endocrine gland, it secretes insulin and glucagon. The endocrine gland portion of the pancreas is a series of specialized cells called islets of Langerhans. Both glucagon and insulin affect glucose utilization by the body's cells. The peptide hormone insulin is produced in beta cells within the islets of Langerhans, while glucagon is produced in alpha cells of the islets. When glucose rises to a select point, insulin is released into the bloodstream. The insulin induces the cells to use more glucose and reduces the amount of glucose being released by the liver, lowering the blood sugar level. Now remember, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes is where the cells, uh, the, the uh, cells are, are no longer sensitive to insulin. So if somebody had type 2 diabetes, giving them shots of insulin wouldn't do you any good. Uh, they, what they need to do is they need to take a... Uh, a medication that uh, induces their cells to actually utilize the insulin. And that drug is known as metformin. Glucagon serves as, uh, as the opposite per serves the opposite purpose of insulin. When the pancreas detects a low blood sugar level, glucagon is released and it induces the liver to release uh, glycogen. There is a paracrine action between the alpha and the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans. And that is the end of the chapter. So uh, you guys stay safe. Uh, keep your article critiques coming. 
Um, and I will talk to you next week.